scattering at an interface, oblique incidents. This video is very much going to mirror the previous video. We're going to set up our problem. We're going to look at an incident wave, figure out how it reflects and transmits. The big difference is that wave is coming in at an angle and now polarization becomes important. We'll then add on top of that and build on that and talk about reflectance and transmittance. This is the fraction of power that gets reflected and transmitted. Very different than the amplitude coefficients we've been talking about, the reflection and transmission coefficients. Then we'll end with a quick example and we will plot reflectance and transmittance as a function of angle of incidence and draw some conclusions from that. Plane wave at oblique incidence. So we start off by defining the geometry of the problem. And in this case, we're going to have our incident wave be incident from the top down, still traveling in the positive Z direction. We see that the interface between the two materials, medium one and medium two, is in the XY plane. Another thing that's very important for the sign convention is to make sure that we have a right-handed system. We know we have a right-handed system when our unit vectors in the X, Y, and Z directions satisfy this equation. Uh, the x-axis cross the y-axis equals the z-axis and so we can use the right hand rule and curl our fingers on our right hand from x to y and our thumb points down in the z direction so we have to make sure we have a right-handed system now just like before these are semi-infinite media so medium one extends out to infinity in the negative z direction medium two extends to infinity in the positive z direction and both of these are of infinite extent in the x and y directions i'm just not really sure how to draw that uh, on a slide here so we're stuck with this now we'll let a wave be incident onto that interface and now we have a wave vector coming in at some arbitrary angle so our incident wave vector has an x component a y component and a z component then the magnitude of that incident wave vector is kx squared plus ky squared plus kz squared. So that's no surprise. And we also remember from previous discussion, by definition, the magnitude of this wave vector is 2 pi over the wavelength. And when we talked about the wave equation, the magnitude of that wave vector is also omega squared mu epsilon. And we'll need all of that. Now, when we have an incoming wave and a surface normal, anytime we have two vectors like that or two directions, they define a plane. That plane is what we will call the plane of incidence. And it turns out everything that will happen here happens in the plane of incidence. We'll have a reflected wave and we'll have a transmitted wave. And all of this lies in the plane of incidence. And since medium one and medium two are of infinite extent, we're really free to rotate that plane however we want to, just in terms of calculating reflection and transmission. If we're calculating angles of polarization and stuff, we're not free to rotate it because that will change our answer. So we have our elevation angle, theta. So that's the angle off the surface normal for our incident wave. So this is also called the angle of incidence. This plane of incidence comes off of the x-axis by an angle phi. So we'll call theta the elevation angle and phi the azimuthal angle. So we have our expression for the incident wave vector, and we can calculate the components of, now, of that now in terms of theta and phi. Well, the magnitude is k naught times the refractive index. So it's n1 because our applied wave is in medium 1 and then cosine phi sine theta for the x component. For the y component, we have a sine phi sine theta, and for the z component, a cosine theta. And we'll recognize these from our spherical to Cartesian conversion equations. So now we have a way of calculating that incident wave vector given the refractive index, given the frequency, and our angles. At this point, we're ready to define and talk about polarization. Before, when we talked about polarization of waves, there were no devices involved. And all we could say was a wave was linearly polarized or circularly polarized. And we said that there was these A and B directions that were perpendicular to the direction the wave is going. 
And otherwise, A and B could just fall anywhere in that plane that was perpendicular to the direction of the wave, and it didn't matter those directions. We also hinted at the time, and I said, as soon as there's a device involved, the choice of those A and B directions becomes important. And so now we have a device, a very simple one. It's just an interface between two different materials. But now our directions for those two polarization becomes very important. And so we'll define our first one to be in a direction perpendicular to the plane of incidence. So when the electric field is perpendicular to the plane of incidence or transverse to the plane of incidence, we'll call that the TE polarization. Also very often called the perpendicular polarization, also called the S polarization. Here's a way that we can calculate it. Remember the property of cross products. If we take a unit vector that's normal to the surface, in this case it's the Z direction, and do a cross product with our incident wave vector, we're guaranteed to get another vector that's perpendicular to both of these. Well, these two vectors define our plane of incidence, so this unit vector that we call ATE must be perpendicular to the plane of incidence. To make sure that that's a unit vector, we'll divide by the magnitude. Since we've defined one direction for our polarization, that makes the other direction for the polarization in the plane of incidence. So when the electric field is polarized purely in the plane of incidence, we call that a TM polarization. Why TM? Well, because when the electric field is polarized in the plane of incidence, that would make the magnetic field transverse. So it's called the TM polarization. This is also called P polarization or parallel polarization. We can calculate a unit vector in the direction of TM, again, using our definition of cross product. This TM polarization has to be perpendicular to K and the TE polarization. So we'll just use the cross product, ATE cross K ints. That's guaranteed to give us a unit vector perpendicular to both of those. And we make it a unit vector by dividing by the magnitude of that cross product. So given our arbitrary angles, theta and phi, we can then calculate unit vectors in the direction of the TE and TM polarizations, and we'll need that. As we mentioned before, everything of interest happens in the plane of incidence. So in other words, reflection and transmission is independent really of that angle phi. So we are free to choose whatever angle phi we wish. So it's convenient and conventional to rotate that to fall to the XZ plane. This does not change our answer at all for how much gets reflected and how much gets transmitted. So those equations stay the same. Now, a word of caution. If you're ever working a problem that asks for the directions of the TE, or the TM direction, or a polarization vector, or the incident wave vector, we can't answer those in this rotated system. This rotated system only gives us the same equations for reflection and transmission. If anything to do with the vectors, incident wave vector, TE, TM, polarization, that has to be in the unrotated, the original coordinate system. Now, when we do rotate to the XZ plane, our TE direction is in the direction of Y. The TM direction will have both an X and a Z component in it. Our wave vector has no Y component now. It's completely confined to the XZ plane. So our equations become simpler. Before we can apply boundary conditions, just like in our previous lecture, we need expressions for the applied, the reflected, and the transmitted wave. So we're doing that here. And so we have this exponential. It's a complex exponential with e to the minus j k dot r. And here I'm using the subscript i again to be the incident wave, the subscript of r for reflected, subscript of t for transmitted. And then what I did over here, we kept the same polarization vector and amplitude for the incident wave, but we expanded that exponential, this k i dot r. And notice, remember, there's no y component because we've rotated our coordinate system. So we only have x and z components of x. Uh, ky is zero. So we have general expressions for the incident wave, reflected wave, and transmitted wave.
Now, when we match boundary conditions, we're really only concerned about where z equals zero. We're not concerned about away from that interface, at least not in terms of just calculating reflection and transmission. So we set z equal to zero in these equations. Well, our equations get even simpler now because all of these exponentials that have z in it, when we set z equal to zero, these all just go to one. And so we're left with these three pretty simple equations for our incident reflected and transmitted waves. Just to remind you one more time, these equations are incorrect. Now, they're not giving the correct values for the vectors here because we're in this rotated coordinate system. So, but they will give us correct answers for reflection and transmission. To get the polarizations and the vector stuff right, we would have to go back to our unrotated coordinate system. We're just doing this to derive expressions for reflection and transmission. Now we apply our boundary condition that says the tangential component for the electric field must be continuous across the interface. Our interface lies in the xy plane. That means the x and y components of the electric field are the tangential components. Here we're looking at the x component. So the total x component of the electric field in medium one has to equal the total x component of the electric field in medium two. Well, in medium one, we know that we only have an incident and a reflected wave. And in medium two, we only have a transmitted wave. And so then we also add in our exponentials describing the propagation. So we derive this equation for the x component of the electric field, just the same procedure, we could derive the same equation for the y component. Now, if we stare at these equations long enough, the only possible way that these equations can be satisfied is if this x component of the wave vector for all three of our waves are the same. So that's a very important boundary condition for our wave vector. And we conclude the tangential component in medium one has to equal the tangential component of the wave vector in medium two. And so in fact, the tangential component for the incident, the reflected and the transmitted all are the same. They are all equal. So that also simplifies things for us. Now we have to think about the longitudinal components, the Z directed components. Well, we know the complete wave vector of the incident wave. That means we know the tangential components for the reflected and transmitted right off. But what about the Z component? This comes from the dispersion relation. The magnitude of our wave vectors are fixed. So for the incident and reflected regions, the magnitude of the wave vectors is K naught times the refractive index in medium one. The magnitude of the wave vector on the transmitted side is K naught times the refractive index in medium two. Since we don't have a Y component on the right, all three of these are just KX squared plus KZ squared, but we mark them as transmitted, reflected, or incident. So we know that our X components are all equal. So why don't we just call them KX? Because we know that they're all equal. Then we solve these equations for the Z component. And we end up here. And we basically have a KZ squared equals the magnitude squared minus the KX squared. It's just that we have a KZ for the incident region, reflected region, transmitted region. And the incident and reflected have a refractive index for medium one. And the transmitted has a refractive index for medium two. From the equations on the previous slide, let's just pull off the equations for the incident and the reflected waves and stare at them. Notice the right hand side of both of these equations is exactly the same. What this tells us is that KZI squared has to equal KZR squared. But what about when we take the square root? Well, we have to resolve this sign, right? Uh, and so where that comes from is we recognize that the reflected wave is actually traveling in the negative Z direction. And so we conclude that the Z component of the wave vector for the reflected wave is the negative of the Z component of the wave vector of the incident wave, simply because it's traveling in the opposite direction.
x and y components of the wave vectors for all waves are the same, but for the reflected wave, we just invert the z component. From this, we have a law of reflection. So here we're just looking at a side view of the interface between medium one and medium two, and we have this incoming wave vector. Well, we can decompose that into a longitudinal component pointing down and a transverse component, kx. And of course, this is at an angle theta i. So in our rotated coordinate system, here's how we're calculating our wave vector components. KY is zero because we're in this rotated system that just lies in the XZ plane. And notice we don't have a sub I or R or T on these two because we know that KX and KY being the transverse components are the same for all the waves. It's just the Z component that's potentially different for all of them. So this is the wave vector for the incident wave. Well, for the reflected wave, we know that the transverse component is the same. So if we're going to draw our reflected wave over here, we just copy that transverse wave. The vertical component is exactly the same, but in the opposite direction. So it's this. And so we can calculate and construct the reflected wave vector simply by adding these two together. That's the X and Z component of the reflected wave. And voila. And it turns out that this angle of reflection is equal to the angle of incidence. Think of it as like playing billiards and the pool ball bounces off the wall. It bounces off the same angle that it hit. And we call this the law of reflection. Angle of reflection equals angle of incidence. Now let's talk about refraction, the transmitted wave. So we start off the same. We have the same Z component and X component. So the X component will be the same for the reflected wave. The Z component is the, is the negative of the Z component of the incident wave. So we got our reflected wave. Now we're going to talk about the second medium. Well, remember, all, all wave vectors have the same X component. So we just copy that down. So whatever is being transmitted into medium two, that has to be the X component. And it is the same thing as the incident wave and also the same thing as the reflected wave. The only thing we have to find is the Z component of the wave vector. The Z component comes from the dispersion relation. We previously used this equation to calculate it. And so we end up getting something rather large simply because N2 is a larger number. Well, now that we have the Z and the X component, we actually now know the wave vector on the transmitted side. And we can fill that in. Apparently, it bends, though. This is not in the same direction as the incident wave. And so this apparent bending of a wave is what is called refraction. If there was no refraction, we would have this incoming wave and it would just keep going along this line. But it doesn't. It's propagating along a different line. There's an apparent bending. And you can see refraction. If you put a stick in water, uh, you'll see an apparent bending. If you hold up a glass of water, if you're at a restaurant and put a spoon or something in there, you'll see this apparent bending. And that's called refraction. We would like to come up with an equation so that we can calculate that theta t, a simple equation. So that's called Snell's Law. So let's start with the dispersion relations for the incident and the transmitted waves. So we have the same X component, but we have different Z components, and we also have different magnitudes because they're in different media. That's our starting point. So we'll solve both of these equations for KX squared. And then these two equations have to be equal because they share a common KX squared. So whatever this expression is, that has to equal whatever this expression is. So we can set them equal. And that's exactly what we do. Well, previously, we had a calculation to calculate this from the angles. And we said it was K naught N1 cosine theta. We'll call that theta I now, the angle of the incident wave. And this should be known. Well, we can do a similar thing for KZ squared. 
right? It has a K naught and two cosine theta t. We don't know what this is yet, but what we can do now is substitute these expressions in to eliminate our kz components. So we end up here. We're getting there. So now we multiply everything out. We simplify a little bit. We see that we have k naughts on every single term here. So those cancel out. Now we're here getting a little bit simpler. We have a trig identity. One minus cosine squared is sine squared. And we see one of those on both sides. So we have an n1 squared, sine squared equals n2 squared, sine squared. We can take the square root of both sides and we end up with what we call Snell's law. And this is the equation that we can use to calculate the angle of transmission. Well, we will have to know the angle of incidence and the refractive indices on either side of the interface. Because there's refractive indices here, remember they're quantifying the speed of a wave. This tells us that refraction is happening because the speed of the wave is changing. So here's the summary of the angles. And we have Snell's law and the law of reflection. So in one summary here, here's the angles, the wave vectors, and our two laws that we use to calculate the angles. So whenever we have a wave at an interface, we'll get a reflected wave and a transmitted wave. The angles of these are easy to calculate. Law of reflection, Snell's law. How much of those waves get reflected and transmitted, that's what we're getting into next. Those end up becoming more complicated equations. And this is where we also have to take into account polarization. The angles of these waves are independent of polarization. So the angle of the transmitted wave, angle of the reflected wave, it doesn't matter polarization. Those angles will always be the same. It's only when we calculate how much gets reflected and how much gets transmitted that that becomes dependent on polarization. And that's where the TE and TM or perpendicular and parallel polarizations become really important. Here's an animation to help drive this home. So what we see is an interface between two different media. Media one has a refractive index of 1.0. So it's something like air. Medium two has a refractive index of 1.5. That's typical of glass or water, maybe a little high for water. And then we have an incident wave shown by the green arrow. And then we're also showing the angle of incidence. Notice that angle goes negative when the wave is coming in from the upper right. And that's because this angle is defined positively as it rotates counterclockwise from the vertical axis. The reflected wave is shown in the red arrow. Notice it always has the same angle as the incident wave, angle of incidence equals angle of reflection. However, it has its positive angle when, when it's rotating clockwise from the vertical axis and its negative angle when it's going counterclockwise from the vertical axis. That's just a sign convention. Then the transmitted wave shown by the blue arrow has its negative angle when we're rotating clockwise from the vertical axis below and positive to the right. So really the ordinary configuration for angle of incidence, we're coming in from the upper left, reflect to the upper right, and then also transmit to the lower right. Notice the angle of the transmitted wave is always a bit smaller than the incident wave. And that's because the refractive index in medium two is larger. The incident wave is sort of sweeping back and forth between positive and negative 90 degrees. So plus and minus 90 degrees is as far as that incident wave can possibly go. But notice the angle of the transmitted wave has a maximum of 42 degrees. So it's really impossible to create a transmitted wave that transmits at an angle greater than 42 degrees. We'll talk about it later, but it's rather interesting when we turn this around and the angle of incidence is from the higher index medium and it's incident at an angle like 60 degrees, much greater than this special angle that seems to be some kind of maximum at 42 degrees that will be called the critical angle. And that's something we'll handle in a later lecture. In the interest of time, I'm not going to derive these equations, but we did derive very similar equations for normal incidence. It's done the same way. We write expressions for the fields, 
we enforce boundary conditions, we manipulate those equations, and out come these equations, and these are called the Fresnel equations. And this is for calculating our reflection and transmission coefficients when there's an angle of incidence. And notice we have a set of equations for our TE polarization, also called S and perpendicular, and we have another set of equations for the TM polarization, also called P in parallel polarization. They look very similar, but make no mistake, they're very different. For example, notice the subscript here on this first angle I. That's the angle of incidence. Over here, that's our angle of transmission. So while the form of the equations looks basically the same, they are quite different. A useful thing I'll point out is that for these equations, the numerator and denominator are essentially the same. It's only this sign that's different. And that's a nice trick just to help us remember the equations and also to calculate them. And the same thing for the TM polarization, essentially the same equation in the numerator and denominator, except for that sign. Uh, you'll also notice that the denominator for both reflection and transmission coefficient is the same. A nice thing to remember for calculations and to try to remember these equations. And then we're also deriving the relation between the transmission and reflection coefficient. And there's another one over here. So in summary, Snell's law, law of reflection, we use that for calculating angles, and that's independent of polarization. How much reflection transmits, we're using these Fresnel equations, and that does depend on polarization. Now that we have these reflection and transmission coefficients, those relate amplitudes. Let's think about the fraction of power that's reflected and transmitted at an interface. This is called reflectance and transmittance. Let's define these terms first. Well, recall our definition for the reflection and transmission coefficients. Again, it's the amplitude of the reflected wave divided by the, the amplitude of the incident wave. That's our reflection coefficient. So reflection transmission coefficients, they're relating field amplitudes. Now, when it comes to power, our reflectance is the ratio of the reflected power to the incident power. So it is the percent or the fraction of power reflected by the interface. Likewise, our transmittance is the fraction of power transmitted through the interface. So it's the power in the transmitted wave divided by power in the incident wave. Let's proceed with these definitions. So when it comes to power, we want to look at our pointing vector. Remember the pointing vector, the RMS pointing vector is one half, the real part of E cross H where we complex, we take the complex conjugate of the H field. Then also recall, we have two general expressions for the electric and magnetic fields that we can use. We started and just defined a plane way for the electric field. We substituted this into Maxwell's equations and we got an expression for the magnetic field dependent on the electric field quantities. Well, we can take this expression for E and plug it into our pointing vector, and we can take this expression for H and plug it into our pointing vector. So that's where we are down here. So the first thing we'll have to do is take the complex conjugate of everything here and then calculate the cross product, take the real component, one half. When we do all that, we end up here. So we have a bunch of constants to the outside. And in terms of being a power, some of this makes sense. We have a, a magnitude of the electric field squared divided by the impedance. And so we can kind of think from circuit theory, this is V squared divided by R. But we also have these Ks sitting here. And that has to do with just the relation and the amplitude of the E and the H. Here's this imaginary component of K. This is responsible for decay. That's our, our alpha term. So, of course, the power will become less as the wave decays. That's what this term is representing. For the most part, we will analyze lossless materials and will tend to ignore that term. But if you have lossy materials, we have to include that term. And then, of course, we end up with the real part of K over the permeability. And in general, these can be complex numbers. That's why at this point, they have to stay inside the real operation. And if we ever then assume lossless materials, we could change that. Here's another trick that is maybe rather counterintuitive. 
So here we're drawing our, our incident wave, reflected wave, transmitted wave in terms of the pointing vector. So the overall pointing vectors are these thick arrows. Here's our incident pointing vector, our reflected pointing vector, and our transmitted pointing vector. And each of those we've decomposed into transverse components. So for the incident vector, we have this component that is parallel to the interface. And then the longitudinal component, that's the component that's pointing straight toward the interface. Now, in terms of calculating how much power is incident, reflected, or transmitted, the trick is we ignore the parallel component or the component of the pointing vector that's traveling parallel to the interface. We only listen to the Z components. And why is that? Well, it's only the Z components that are actually carrying power to or from the interface. These transverse components are just carrying power parallel to the interface. So we ignore them in our calculations of reflectance and transmittance. So to derive these expressions, we're going to redefine our definitions of R and T slightly. Now that we know that we only have to listen to the Z components of the pointing vector, that's how we'll redefine things. So our reflectance now becomes the Z component of the reflected wave divided by the Z component of the pointing vector of the incident wave. And likely the transmittance becomes the Z component of the pointing vector for the transmitted wave divided by the Z component of the pointing vector for the incident wave. Well, we had expressions on the previous slide for our pointing vector. And so we can plug those into our equation. So we have our reflectance, which was this equation. When we only carry the Z component through for the pointing vector, we get this expression divided by this expression. And all these terms cancel out. And for reflectance, we just end up with the magnitude of the reflected wave squared divided by the magnitude of the incident wave squared. Now for the transmittance, we do the same thing. Z component of the pointing vector of the transmitted wave divided by Z component of the pointing vector of the incident wave. However, not as many things cancel this time. We have a similar ratio that we had for reflectance, but we also have this other term here that has the real part of K over permeability. And let's give that some more thought. So for reflectance, for the reflection coefficient, we had the amplitude of the reflected wave equals R times the amplitude of the incident wave. Well, we derived an expression for reflectance as the amplitude squared divided by amplitude squared. So for the amplitude of the reflected wave, that was R times the amplitude of the incident wave. So we'll take the magnitude of this and square it. And it turns out that reflectance is just the magnitude of R squared because these amplitudes of E ints cancel. So reflectance is just the magnitude of the reflection coefficient squared. That had a simple conclusion. The transmittance is a bit more complicated because we had that extra term. So let's talk about that. So remember our definition of the transmission coefficient. That lets us write the amplitude of the transmitted wave as T times the amplitude of the incident wave. So this is the expression we derived a couple slides ago for the transmittance, except we can replace the amplitude for the transmitted electric field with T times the amplitude of the incident field. These E sub I's now cancel. And we need to give this some more thought. But in the end, we end up with this general expression for the transmittance. But we can do some more work with that. So when our medium is lossless and our permeability is purely real, we can simplify this down and we can get an equation that resembles what you'll see in the textbooks. But this is the general equation when there's loss in one of the materials. Okay, so for lossless materials, our Z component is this, our refractive index is the square root of mu times epsilon, and our impedance is mu divided by epsilon. So we take all of this and we can substitute that into this equation, do a bunch of algebra that I won't repeat here, and in the end, we end up with our equation for the transmittance.
this is what you'll see in a textbook but make no mistake that is for lossless materials also where the permeability is purely real which happens when they're lossless but it's neat to have this equation on hand if there's ever loss it's a bit more general so how are the parameters related well let's divide the transmittance for te divided by the transmittance for tm we plug in our two expressions and we actually get this relation so the ratio of the transmittance terms is equal to the magnitude squared of the ratio of the transmission coefficients and sometimes that lets us shortcut and calculate transmittance of one or the other if the other is known We need to take this one step further and kind of generalize our concept of total reflectance and transmittance. And that's because we've been treating TE and TM waves separately. But in general, when we have an applied wave, it could potentially have both TE and TM components. For example, we might have a circularly polarized wave. So how do we handle that? Well, the total incident power is the power in the TE polarization plus the power in the TM polarization. That makes sense. If we were then to calculate reflection and transmission, the first thing we would do is separate our applied wave into a TE, TM component, calculate reflectance and transmittance for both of those, and then think about how to pull them back together. So if we know how much power is in the applied wave in the te component of that well we know how much power from the applied wave would be reflected that's rte likewise we can look at the power in the tm polarization see how that gets reflected as rtm if we add both of these up we get the total reflected power so it's kind of like we have a wave coming in we decompose it to te and tm polarizations we analyze separately reflection and transmission and then we add our answers back again to get the total reflectance and total transmittance. So the transmitted is the same. We will look at how much power is in the TE component of the applied wave, analyze transmission reflection, and we'll get a transmittance for the TE polarization. We'll take the power that's in the TM polarization of the applied wave and calculate the transmittance for it. And then we multiply these two things, we add them up, and we get the total power transmitted. So the overall total reflectance is the overall total reflected power divided by over total, total power of the incident wave. And so then we just plug in the expressions we have up here, and we get this. So if we ever have a general wave with both te and tm components we have to separate them treat them separately figure out how much power in each one gets transmitted reflected and then add everything back together to get these overall reflectance and transmittance terms let's just end this with a quick example and let's take a typical interface between two materials and plot reflectance and transmittance as a function of angle of incidence so our first example on the left, we have a wave going from air to glass. So the refractive index of medium one is 1.0, refractive index of medium two is 1.5. Uh, these special angles, critical and Brewster's angle, that's not something we've talked about yet, so we won't talk about that here. We will jump straight to these plots. So we have angle of incidence along the horizontal axis, and then we have percentage along the vertical axis. And the blue line is plotting the reflectance of the TE polarization or perpendicular polarization. And the red dashed line is plotting the reflectance of the parallel or the TM polarization. Now notice that reflection pretty much goes up as we start coming in at a higher angle of incidence. And this is a, an overall trend. If we ever want to enhance reflection, normally we can just increase the angle of incidence. Notice also that the reflectance of the parallel polarization actually gets lower around here and actually hits zero. This special angle is called the Brewster's angle, and this is something we'll talk about in a later lecture, a very interesting angle.
Now let's look at the case where we're going from glass to air. So our wave is going from a high refractive index to a low refractive index. N1 is 1.5 and N2 is 1.0. And the lines mean the same thing. The blue line is the reflectance of the perpendicular polarization and the red line is the reflectance of the parallel polarization. Well, just like before, this parallel polarization has a point where it has zero reflection. That is the Brewster's angle again. But an interesting thing happens. The reflection goes to 100% at some magical angle here, and that's called the critical angle. And for angle of incidences above the critical angle, reflection is 100%. It's totally reflected. And so that's called total internal reflection. And it's responsible for wave guiding and optical fibers and other dielectric wave guides. So these plots are very typical of what reflection looks like from an interface. And we'll talk more about critical angle, Brewster's angle, and that sort of stuff in following lectures. So that is it for this lecture. I hope it was helpful to you.